I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know who I am. I know God's plan and I'll follow him in faith. And from this position, power begins. No go. From the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah, this is Heart of the Matter, where we're working together to understand the sacred faith in the age of fulfillment. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. Seth loves it when I sit up after we start. Tonight, Monday, is our short show. Tomorrow night, Tuesday, will be our longer show. Your comments on the short show are read on Tuesday nights, but not necessarily the week after. Sometimes we skip a week, so... Uh, write your comments below on anything we happen to say. Subscribe, click the like button, share the show with others. On we go. We've been talking about church governance in our past long shows. And I want to downshift sort of and talk about people who individually, individually seek to dominate and control us um, by appealing to being in the faith. You know, controlling people who are in the faith, not necessarily the institution. As my friend Eric pointed out to me last week, there is probably no greater expression of this, these power-hungry type people, in many ways, than the LDS, who see themselves in, uh, in these powerful positions when they engage with other people. The reason why this exists in Mormonism more than it typically exists in regular old Christianity is because the LDS claim a number of very special possessions as members of the Mormon church. And uh, this is uh, creates sort of a special attitude and it's, can, it's uh, given to converts when they join the Mormon church, but it is, uh, it is, planted and grown in, in children of a very young age. They sing in their primary, that's the young children's group, I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know who I am. I know God's plan, and I'll follow Him in faith. And from this position, power begins. Junior attends grammar school, and he's armed with this powerful identity. I know God's plan, is what he walks around the world with kind of saying. And therefore, those around me who do not belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints might not receive the best treatment from me. They don't know God's plan. It's a power play and automatically creates an us-versus-them mentality even in young children, you talk to people here in the state of Utah, there are children who go to uh, mostly predominant LDS schools and they find themselves ostracized by kids who have this idea that I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know who I am. I know God's plan. And if you're not one of us, you don't. The interesting thing is in Christianity in general, um, this chutzpah is not ingrained in the same way with Christian children. Uh, they are more inclined to swear belief in Jesus at a young age, but rarely are they taught, I belong to a non-denominational church on the corner of filth, filth of Fifth and Elm, and I know who I am, and I know God's plan, and I will follow him in faith. That doesn't, it doesn't come about the same way with most Christian kids. From childhood, LDS children are then baptized at the age of eight, with many, uh, which many people experience. And there is a special emphasis in the Mormon water baptism. Uh, it makes the baptized person an official member of the Mormon church and uh, someone who uh, can go on and hold an LDS priesthood. And they've been baptized by somebody with this LDS priesthood which they say is the authority to act in God's name on earth. And when they receive this baptism, they are cleansed of their sins uh, uh, as the participant. And then every week, the person renews their baptismal covenant uh, uh, every Sunday at church as, as uh, the priesthood bearers in the church 
create the sacrament and they give it out to the people with their authority. See, so we have this authority tied into the power that goes along with it. Pretty soon the teenagers, when they turn, actually when, they, when boys turn 12 years old, they receive this priesthood by the laying on of hands of somebody who has it. And they bestow this power of the priesthood upon them, 12 year olds. And the, this title is used uh, to control the young lads in an attempt to keep them worthy. You gotta be worthy of this priesthood that you've been given. God's power given to you, 12 year old, be worthy of it. When an LDS uh, priesthood holder baptized by the power of the same priesthood encounters the rest of the world, they begin to exercise a subtle, sometimes it's overt, uh, arrogance toward the non-baptized and toward the non-priesthood holders. But it doesn't end there. At 18 years of age, many young men in the Mormon church are invited to receive another type of priesthood, uh, the Melchizedek priesthood, which is an elevated step up uh, in their personal religious pride. And then they go through a man-made temple and they receive rituals that endow them. It's called the endowment. And they are endued or endowed with these gifts and promises and blessings from God that they will become gods too and goddesses later on if they are worthy. And then they walk out of that temple, they wear garments, underclothes, underwear, and they wear it under their clothes. And, and these garments are another form of, of, that increases the arrogance and pride of the person wearing them. And the point of all this is that it's contrary. What it creates is contrary to the humble, meek, gentle, broken attitude that the Lord recommends. As he said, the Lord is near to those that have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. I have appealed to the LDS model, which is way over the top when it comes to creating arrogant uh, people of power. But there are similar responses found within the realms of Christianity, again, written large. In my estimation, any and every Christian on earth ought to view themselves in the capacity of being unworthy, as being chief among sinners, and entering the kingdom of God by the skin of their teeth. I say this because I find no real justification on the part of a believer toward hubris and arrogance toward any person, believer or not, or somehow believing themselves to be superior to the surrounding world. What is, uh, what we are really as Christians is we're fortunate. We're blessed beyond compare. We're wholly reliant upon God for whatever he does with us in our Christian lives. And there's really no issue with appealing to the power that God exercises through us. There's nothing wrong with that to transform us, but with that comes giving him all the credit and really for the marvelous work he's doing in us while looking at ourselves as truly broken, humble, uh, blessed recipients of what he has to give. I just wanted to broach the subject by making a comparison to the powerful attitudes in the faith as a means to warn ourselves against it, that they really have no place in believers. Write your comments below and we'll read them on Tuesday night, the long show right here on Heart of the Matter.